Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today to watch uh, Author on Author. This is my first time hosting this, so I'm really, truly, seriously excited to host this event. My name is Dani Ramadan. I'm the writer in residency at the Saskatoon Public Library. And today we have two fantastic authors that we are going to uh, get to know just in a bit. At first, I would like to do a land acknowledgement for the land that I'm recording from. I am currently in Vancouver uh, because of COVID-19, I couldn't be in Saskatoon. And Vancouver is very special to me um, because I'm an uninvited guest on the unceded uh, territories of the Squamish, uh, Tsleil-Waututh and the Musqueam people. As a newcomer, as a refugee who came here uh, to Canada, this is really important to me as it speaks to uh, the colonization system that created the place we call Canada at the moment, but also speaks to the effect of colonization years after uh, the, the Brits and the French left my country of birth, which is Syria, that caused uh, the, the, the dynamics that, that led to me becoming a refugee and coming here to Canada. Um, let's get right into it. We have two fantastic, amazing authors today to talk to. We have Jay Jill Robinson and Joan Crate today. Jay is coming, Jill is coming all the way from uh, Saskatchewan and Joan, uh, Joan is coming all the way from uh, BC. So I cannot wait to host this space. Hi folks. Hello. Hello there. I, I'm so excited to have both of you here. I am really looking forward to hearing uh, the reading that you sent me. I, I was quite moved by June's, uh, by John's work today and, and Jill's uh, novella, first chapter of a novella. I was so excited. I wanted to read it so much more. Awesome. That's wonderful. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let me read your bios first, and then we will uh, dig right into some readings. So we will start with uh, J. Jill Robinson is the author of four collections of stories and one novel. Before, before moving to Banaf in 2009, she lived in Saskatoon, where she served at the Saskatoon Public Library's writer in residency in 2002. Her work has been published in many Canadian journals and has won numerous prizes and awards, including two Saskatchewan Book Awards for the novel, More in Anger. She is currently serving as the Regina Public Library Writer in Residency. Hi, Jill. Hi. Hi. And on the other end, we have uh, John uh, Crate, who was born in the Northwest Territories and now lives in Calgary in the rural Okanagan. She writes both poetry and fiction and has won several writing awards over the years, including the W.O. Mitchell City of Calgary Book Award for Black Apple, which was released in 2017, uh, which was shortlisted also for the Frank Higgy Higgy for the Frank Higgy Award and listed in CBC's 10 Books You Must Read list in 2016. The band U2, of whom she's a big fan, and I am too, featured her poem, I'm a Prophet, on screen in their latest Canadian tour. She lost her partner of almost four decades at the end of February 2020. I'm sorry to hear about your loss, John. Thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, Jill, would you like to start reading first? Or, sh uh, yeah, like, go ahead, tell us a bit about your work and let's read, let's hear your reading first. Hello. Um, I'll be going, I'll be reading to you from uh, a novella entitled Bereft, um, and this section of the novella is set in Banff, Alberta. Um, I think that's all I'll say right now, Banff, 1933. <clears throat> Between bites of toast and marmalade, Tom and his mother were talking. Tom with his eyes cast down as he listened, Eleanor, her face alive with expression and wearing this smile, she worked to keep soft, talking about university, talking about what he should study and wear. Medicine, like his father. Yes, mama. McGill, like his father. Yes, mama. She poured him another cup of tea and added his milk and sugar. She offered him a spoon so he could do the stirring himself. Now, where were we, she said. They looked up at the same time to see an odd sight, Mrs. Winter, the minister's wife, crossing the street from the manse and approaching their house at a run. That in itself, 
a big woman like Mrs. Winter running was certainly unusual. Not only that, but she was still in her dressing gown and carrying a teacup. She knocked, but then opened the front door herself before their girl, Florica, could get there and rushed right in, presenting the cup to Eleanor. Eleanor, excuse me. Eleanor, look, she said breathlessly. Tom's mother smiled at her friend and calmly took the cup. It was yellow, yellow like buttercups. She peered into it. Tom, tall and gangly, rose and moved behind his mother so that he too could stoop over and see into the cup. Eleanor perused the pattern the dark leaves made against the pale yellow interior. I'm so sorry for rushing in, Margaret Winter said. It looked serious somehow, different, the way the leaves are all clumped together like that. Don't you think? Right away I wanted to know what you thought. Eleanor's smile faded into a look of concern. She lowered the cup and after a long pause, she said with uncharacteristic solemnity, I see a thick crepe bow, Margaret. Oh dear, said Mrs. Winter with a small nervous laugh. That doesn't sound good. Eleanor looked up. Margaret, someone close to you, but not related, is going to die. Oh my. Usually what Eleanor saw in the tea leaves involved a visitor from far away or a new hat or a present arriving in the mail. Hesitantly, she took the cup back. Now I wonder who that could be. Two days of heavy snowfall began that night, and the next day the children built snowmen in the yard and went sledding on the nearby Buffalo Street Hill at the end of their driveway. You're in charge, Tom, said his mother as she wrapped the scarf around his neck. You look after everyone and watch out for wild animals. Yes, Mama, he said. As night began to fall, suddenly in the Rockies, the sun slipping quickly behind the mountains, they returned to the house soaking wet and exhausted, and no one mentioned their snowball fight. Florica had hot chocolate waiting for them, and they changed into their pajamas even though it was early, and gathered in the living room where they snuggled up in the big overstuffed chairs in Chesterfield by the fireplace and sipped their cocoa. All of the children but Tom caught colds, and the house was soon filled with snuffling, coughing, and hacking. Eleanor worried, clung to her husband, and pleaded, They're going to be all right, aren't they, Clive? Clive? Of course they are, he said, his patience tried. All children catch colds, Eleanor. But as the hours and days passed, she grew increasingly frantic, and common sense flew out the window. You're married to a medical man. I know, but... Dad's a doctor, Mama Tom said, attempting to comfort her. He knows what to do. Be quiet, Tom, she said, sharply, but with a tight smile, which sent his heart plunging to his feet. You don't know. Clive, Eleanor, I know what I'm talking about. I can't help it, Clive, I'm afraid, Eleanor said. And as her husband dutifully moved to hold her, she pulled away. Don't touch me, please, I feel cold. I need a shawl. Tom, I'll get it, Mama. I don't expect you to understand the power of prophecy, Clive, of the tea leaves you've never understood. Tom's father responded in a steady, stern voice, Eleanor. First you frightened Margaret half senseless, and now you're scaring yourself as well. There's nothing to the leak tea leaves, Ellie. Wednesday. Cora's chest stayed congested. Her breathing grew labored. Tom stood behind, beside her bed next to his father, glanced over often, worried. His father put a reassuring hand on his shoulder. His father, his infallible father, who then went downstairs and sent Florica over to borrow kettles from the neighbors. And once the kettles were filled and heated to the boiling, she and Tom carried the big pots of steaming water up the stairs and into Cora's sick room. When the other children returned home from school, they could hear their sister's small and tired barking coughs coming from upstairs. How is she, they asked. How's our Cora? They took turns sitting with her, kissing her cheeks, singing to her, holding her hands as she struggled with less and less strength to breathe. I'll go, me first, me next. But then came the night that the other doctor came. Tom, his bedroom above the, the front door, heard the steps on the porch. Heard the other doctor quietly lift the knocker and let it fall gently. Heard his father open the door, heard the two men's voices commingle and fade as the other doctor entered the house and the door shut behind him. There was nothing to be done, 
and early the next morning, her father sitting beside her and stroking her forehead, Cora died. <clears throat> Saturday. Tom waited until the house was quiet before he entered the living room and slowly approached the small white coffin resting on a low table beside the piano. He sat down on the end of the piano bench and looked at Cora's small body and grief flooded him with a sudden terrifying force. He couldn't move. He couldn't breathe. Five years old. Not two weeks ago, he piggybacked her around the yard, her strong little heels digging into his ribs. Giddy up, Tommy, faster. Those little white shoes, now so still. How could it be? He touched Cora's cold little fingers and a shudder ran through him. He bent to kiss her goodbye, but stopped before his lips touched her forehead. He couldn't. He pulled back, wiped his eyes with the heels of his hands, bowed his head and sobbed. His mother refused to come out of the bedroom and she wouldn't let anyone in, not even his father. Tom had knocked and called, Mama, Mama, no answer. The next day after the funeral service, the family accompanied Cora to the cemetery up the gentle slope of Buffalo Street before it turned the corner and became steep, before it turned into a hill to sled down, when, where Cora had caught her cold only a week ago. The day was warmer and most of the early snow had melted. I lift up mine eyes, the Reverend Winter said. To the mountains, Tom said to himself, his thoughts drifting. To Cascade, Rundle, Sulphur. His mother whispered that she was cold and he shifted, moved closer to her. How strange it was that Cora was not there, he thought, poking him, asking him to pick her up. Instead, she was in that small white coffin beside that yawning hole. The minister's wife, Mrs. Winter, had not come to the service at the church. Had stayed home smashing teacups, perhaps, Tom thought, strewing loose tea on the remaining snow. It was her fault for bringing that teacup over for his mother to read. His father was right. Who believed all that malarkey anyway? Not him. Not him anymore, if he ever had. He closed his eyes determined not to cry. He opened the front door for his mother and they entered the silent house. Busily, Eleanor removed, folded up and handed him her black mohair wrap, then straightened doilies in the foyer, straightened chairs. But then she suddenly stopped. She stood completely still in the quiet room and Tom watched her wondering what to do. And then with her arms loose at her sides, her body slackened, crumpled, and she began to cry. Tom, she said in an unbearably sad voice, Tom. She looked on the verge of collapse and he, frightened, dropped the shawl to the floor and was behind her, beside her, and she turned and leaned her weight so hard against him he lost his balance and had to step back. He regained his footing and took his mother awkwardly in his arms and held her, eased her gently into the dining room and onto a chair. He heard the heavy steps on the wide wooden porch, heard the others come through the front door, and there was life in the house again. The relatives returned home. Tom and his brother and sisters returned to school. Cora's white marble lamb arrived, and Tom helped Lucas slug it over to the graveyard in a wheelbarrow and maneuver it into place. Life inexplicably went on, resumed for the most part its daily repetitions and increments, its forward motion. Winter arrived, and ice formed on the Bow River, obscuring its vast flow beneath a white, uneven surface. In bright sunshine, the mountains gleamed with fresh snow. There would be no sledding, decreed their mother, and no mention of Cora's name ever again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jill. That was such a heartfelt reading. I really appreciated it. I really like the way that you move from the micro to the to the big picture in, in such ease in your writing. It feels so inviting, it feels so musical even. And specifically when you're using that with such a traumatic story, it, it feels like you are lulling your reader into seeing the trauma the way it is. I really appreciate that reading. Thank you, Jill. 
Thank um, you very much. Yeah, we move to uh, Joan. Joan, uh, it is your time. I'm looking forward to your reading. I read it before I read the poem before. It's heartbreakingly beautiful. So I'm sure a lot of people are going to appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Danny. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm right now on the unceded lands of the Okanagan. And uh, what I'm going to read now is, um, it's from a journal. And I started the journal when my husband was diagnosed with uh, terminal cancer. And um, it was all, the journal was kind of all I could put down um, after he died, which was February 28th of this year. I started writing poetry, so I finished with uh, two poems, but here we go. Countdown journal, March 24th, 2018. It's 10 a.m. and I'm on coffee number three, watching Colbert reruns in bed with you, husband, playing computer solitaire beside me. You smell like home, like a mattress floating on the Dead Sea, sun luminous above us, fathoms of black blood twisting below. You have cancer, we know that now, two tumors in your liver that have metastasized from your colon. The sun presses anemia against the window. Every now and then a magpie sweeps between tree branches and off the edge of the page. March 25th. And in the news, youth are marching in Washington, LA, all across the US against firearms. In Canada, we have supporting marches. Murder happens everywhere, sometimes plotted, awaited, discharged. Sometimes a shadow on a wall, a silent assassin, an explosion of cells. We lie in bed cocooned. You play computer solitaire. At the end of almost every hand, the words, you win, explode in confetti. You're good at games with numbers. Countdown. It's not just youth marching against guns. People of all ages now against assault rifles. One girl scribbled, don't shoot on her palms. A little boy holds a sign that reads, I can't even bring peanut butter to school. School assassinations, small, inconsequential murders, like the ones that happen every day all over the world. The constant procession of death, the sporadic parades against it. Your oncologist phones, your CT scan shows small cancers swimming in, your, in the black sea of your abdomen. March 26, today I will get up. I'm going to wash and dress. I can put off washing my hair another day. I will drive to the grocery store. I can do this. Daughter phones from Alaska. She asks if they told us how long you have. They haven't, and we won't ask. She says, if there's anything I can do, the children, I say. I bought you a spearmint colored shirt. Wearing it, you fall asleep beside me, green, olive, and unconscious. You have beautiful bones in your face. One cheekbone cracked down the middle by a childhood fall while up a tree stealing almonds. The eye on that side is pulled at the corner and waters. It looks like you're crying when you're not. March 31st, we go to an Easter egg hunt. Kids in spring sweaters find plastic eggs in the grass under picnic tables, resting in branches. They trade them in for chocolate eggs, jelly beans, and marshmallow bunnies. They aren't our grandchildren, but they have lightning in their joints and crickets in their whispers. They are fully human, wholly primal, holy and made of muscle, bones, organs, and orifices, a lisp, inappropriate language, greed, kindness, and questionable choices, everything innocence is made of. Later, friends on the way back to Red Deer drop in. We talk about how long they might have, quietly, of how I won't, won't slash my wrists or walk into Lake Okanagan with a pocket full of rocks. Bob the carpenter comes by. He asks how bad your cancer is. Bob will build us a desk and bookshelf sometime soon. He's been talking about doing it for three years. But now you say, can you make it before I die? Our friend says, good, 
You're using your cancer for something constructive, literally. April 11th, first paracentesis, 4.6 liters of liquid, the color of apple juice drained from your treasonous body, an orchard of spreading black branches and poisoned fruit. You were born in an orchard in Lebanon, picked four tons of apples each, each season. The doctor tells you your surname is the same as the town he's from in northern India. He wants you to know about you, when you came to Canada, how we met. You from heat and bombs, me from arsenic flakes, from the mine drifting over snow. You rise from the medical chair with its extensions and supports, your lungs floating on a bed of air. You breathe, you grin, you have not forgotten how. We know that our story is a stutter in the wind, that it's part of a greater story, that it is an insignificant detail buried under heaps of human garbage in a landfill planet. But we tell it to the doctor anyway, and he talks of death, its mutilation, the odor and aftertaste that overcame him in the early years of his practice. We too are learning about the fossils and scars mortality leaves on the earth, how bodies look when cut from life. Perfect. April 24th. Today you're so weak, I'm the one to drive us to the hospital for chemo. As we walk to the pay station, I hear the dying honky donkey. I hear the dying donkey bray you make when you vomit. The splatter of liquid on asphalt. Your, fill, your pills, a constellation of futility. You wipe your mouth, and we trudge through the hospital past the marble statue of Hippocrates, who holds a scroll to his thigh. From a distance, it looks like a penis. He's always glad to see us. Past the medical bookstore, student lockers, the mailroom, fire doors, past the cafeteria, where a cook you speak to in Arabic makes the best omelets I've ever had past diagnostic imaging and nuclear medicine to the chemo center they whimsically call daycare. A nurse plugs you into an IV and leaves. It's not long before I have to run after her. She gets you something that looks like a feed bag to vomit in. They give you anti-nausea drugs through your IV, then hook the port sitting under a layer of skin in your chest with another drug, 5-FU. F you too. Later, you and I are in each other's arms. Breathe, Catherine, a cancer survivor advised. Remember to breathe. The long vet baths together, the ceremony of wine and leisurely chats before elaborate lovemaking have been reduced to skilled groping. We've got this. Senior chemo sex. August 8th. A heat wave right across Canada. In the Maritimes, dogs are dying from the blue-green algae that poisons the water they plunge into to cool off. Wildfires in California burn through the state. Houses, people, their bodies unrecognizable in ditches of ash. Funeral processions pour down Grecian streets like gasoline. The bodies pulled from blackened houses and fields, pre-cremated, livestock barbecued. Australian farms radiate through the TV screen, red and shriveled as the crust of Mars, our future spinning 50 million miles away and closer with every degree. Get used to it, climatologists warn. Global warming, dying seas, fish and mammals, scarcity, flood, famine, hurricanes, extinction. September 16th, oldest son phones from Vancouver. There was an incident. He ripped off his clothes on Hastings, tried to light himself on fire. The police, psych cord full, they sent him home. Now he has to take his meds in front of a pharmacist. But that is not the problem. He always takes his meds. The problem is his meds no longer work. October 30th, chemo again. You in the big armchair, tubes running to your chest. Me sitting across from you writing this. 
Tomorrow is Halloween, and as we drove to the hospital, we passed houses decorated in, it, in skeletons, witches and ghouls, some figures animated, lurching, cackling, flinging limbs. The tea and cookie ladies vanish in shadows, outside a shedding of acid rain. January 6th. Sitting in the waiting room before your first CT scan of the year, you tell me you're not ready to die, but the results don't agree. The tumors in your lungs and liver are growing. As we drive home, your right hand drops from the steering wheel and brushes my hand, my leg, comforting me. I go to bed with a humongous Toblerone and a big bag of M&Ms around six. When you ask about supper, I tell you, I'm not getting it. I'm not getting out of bed. You get up and make tabbouleh, bring me some, kissing my forehead. You comforting me, comforting me. February 28th, 2020. Head thrown back, sprawled across the bed. You are already dream and fallen flesh, traveling between worlds. One finger on consciousness, you backstroke through a Mideastern childhood fractured by bombs. Your, old, your closest brother blown to bits, earth split with drought, and that river of years that swept away a boy with a tapeworm. In Canada's cold throttled winter, you are a non-entity with frostbitten fingers and a secondhand ski jacket haunting Toronto streets. A young man barely seen, hardly noticed. How our acquisitions and projected identities collapse as we age into ourselves. I watch your eyes shift under closed lids, moving along currents of time. Your skin cool as fallen leaves, while your pulse races through an obstacle course of disease. Moisture freezes on window glass. I am on one side of the pain and you on the other, floating away from me. March 20th, 2020. You are ashes in memory now. A sealed marble urn I pass by every morning stumbling to the kitchen for coffee. We're in quarantine together. Your chart remains in my scattered gray thoughts. There's no news on the TV other than the pandemic, but yesterday I heard brakes squeal and metal crunch. Today I awoke with road rash down my legs and glass embedded in my palms, screaming like a siren. All day clouds and scavenger leaves press against the bedroom window, mouthing your name. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. I really appreciate it, your reading. It is heartfelt. Every word is, is cutting like a knife, yet beautiful. Like it's it's stunning to be honest like the 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 day that i read it uh it really moved me and now with your reading with your voice it really left me with with a lot of challenging beautiful emotions to be honest so thank you so much for your reading i really appreciate it thank you. all right so um i'm going to start with a question about grief um that's to both of you so the theme that I saw in both of your work is grief, this unbearable, almost cruel um, weight of grief in uh, your poem, John, and the study, the hidden grief that is seen on the outside that tells so much more from the inside in Jill's story. So um, let's start with you, John. How do you, how do you describe the relationship between your own work as an author and between such a strong and overpowering emotion like grief? And then Jill, you can answer the same question. Well, I think um, for me, writing out of grief was the only way I could write. It was the path to writing. Um, grief also allows you to see the world in a different way, I think. You, you see, um, you see in, in a narrower way, in a sense, that you see your own grief, and yet you see in a wider way in that it goes beyond 
uh, even the human world, I think. We start, you start seeing the world in a, in a more abstract way, perhaps. The things in the world that are not concrete to us, uh, such as feelings of grief. But, but um, it really helped me to see, I think, yeah, yeah, the world in a greater sense and, and in different times, in different time zones and through centuries. And uh, it, uh, in a sense, it, it was a path to kind of a more spiritual way of looking at life. Mm -hmm. I see that, yeah. Jill, what do you think? I think that, well, I was just, while I was listening to Joan, I was thinking how, uh, what, what she was writing about the grief that is intensely personal for her from her own personal experience uh, is where the power uh, comes from, came from for, to create the poems, to write the poems. And whereas for me, it's a, it, it's a different process because that child who died in my piece uh, wasn't close to me. I didn't know her. It was, it was my father's little sister. And so what happens for me is uh, in, in trying to access the, the situation to, to write about the grief that my father and his family felt, because at this point I was very interested in exploring family history and, and my family spent a lot of time in Banff. So it, uh, this was one of the in, uh, events that occurred. And so I'm, I'm working from the outside in, where Joan is in a sense working from the inside out. Uh, that I have to go in and discover it, whereas for her, it's hugely alive and thriving in her. For me, it's a, it was a mining process where, where you look and look and, tr and go in there and try to, try to enter that space of that, that family's grief and understand the situation and the experience that they're having. Um, yeah. I, I really appreciate that answer, I really do. Um, grief for me specifically, to be honest, is such a strong emotion to write from because as, as an author, um, when I look at my grief towards my own country, it's like a grief for a place that doesn't exist anymore. It's the grief of um, living inside of a memory of what Syria is for the past um, 25 years of my life. And then I come here and I'm, I am... I lose that place and that place continues to change. So it's a, it's a completely different dynamic to grief that, that drives my writing into this nostalgic space where, where I wonder about, about what the lives of people over there looks like that I don't have access to and to the fact that I don't remember the maps of Damascus anymore. I don't remember every building the way that I used to. I don't remember where I used to buy my vegetables so losing bits and pieces of the relationship that you have with the city makes with the with the with the city makes grief even more meaningful i guess but i i really appreciate both of your your ways of looking at it as jill was saying uh your way john of of looking at it from the inside out seeks so much of your ability to tell that that difficult, challenging story, yet see, see the beauty of the words in it, even when it's, it's heartbreakingly challenging. Yes, Jill? I was just going to uh, say something about, the, about desire and, and the drive to write. I mean, we're both, we're all human beings, but we're also writers. And so mm -hmm. trying to make sense of, of uh, intensely personal, painful suffering, mm -hmm. uh, our way is through through writing and, and through language. And um, uh, uh, I'm sure, you, well, as we've heard in Joan's work, you, you can tell that some of the most powerful, beautiful, important mm -hmm. writing comes out of this very suffering and grief that you have to be willing to go into head on, that you can't sort of skirt around the edges or you have to like plunge yourself into that sorrow and suffering and pain, um, you and your country of, of Syria and and Joan of, of Kamal and your own loss and and uh, the writing that I'm doing right now while I'm working here uh, 
is more like that in that it's not to do with death of of a person it's a death of a relationship mm -hmm. my uh, marriage suddenly fell apart and it shook me deeply last about a year ago and mm -hmm. so for me writing has been a way for me to try to understand, to deal with the pain, to uh, express myself. And, and I think that it's pretty darn good writing. <laughs> and, and so the writer part of me uh, looks at this and goes, yeah, because I don't know about you, Joan, but I don't usually write out of happiness or, oh boy, I better write about this great thing. That, that most of my, I mean, that can act as a counter, but the, 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 the beginning point is from not understanding or for yearning or for the desire to know or or to to remember that gets onto the page yeah yeah i i think uh that's true i i can't say i mean i think i write out of joy sometimes but it's joy discovered often through, yeah. through things like grief and loss um in fact i don't even know if we really can start treasuring things um you know as children everything is presented the world is presented to us and then we take it for granted but it kind of takes loss i think before we start being able to really appreciate often very small things often it's the small things that we appreciate in the, kind of in the face of loss and after loss and that's kind of a pure, you know, a very pure form of joy, but it's also for something small that represents mm -hmm. um, maybe what we had or, or that is maybe indicative of, of the shiny things that are still out there, the wonderful things that are, that are still out there. I think we often, you know, you, you see a, an eagle fly, it's just amazing. It's mm -hmm. one small thing, but it's indicative of, of more. Like the, the universal and the particular, and in that being able to take that thing. This is the way that we're doing in COVID. I mean, it is to find, it, it's, it's the loss of so much that makes us appreciate what we've lost and go, I mean, just as thing as being able to run up and hug somebody is suddenly that you would just, as a child, you wouldn't even think about it. Or even as me last year, <laughs> wouldn't think about it. And all of a sudden, yeah. all these things that we just assumed, they would always be like this. Mm. So I guess the Buddhists teach us that there's, that, that there's nothing but uncertainty and that, and that our idea that, that, that we can identify certainties and structure our lives around them is bullshit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. I think that grief indeed helps us to mature in a way, helps us to see the world in a bigger, under a bigger lens with a bigger understanding of, of who we are as humans, which definitely reflects back to who we are as writers. But speaking of COVID, I mean, this is the mandatory question of every online event that we have right now. Uh, COVID 2020, really, in, in all of its glorious fire that we have been seeing over, over the past uh, nine months, um, has changed us and changed the way that we cope with each other and, and connect with each other quite a lot. But how, how are you both doing spiritually? And, and not just that, but how are you both doing creatively? Uh, how do you navigate writing and participating in the literature scene during the time of COVID-19? Let's start with Joe. I was fortunate in March, just as COVID uh, was in, invading us, or what the right, whatever the right word is, uh, I was uh, on Galliano Island in um, my cabin there, which is in the woods, which is away from everything, where you are not likely to touch anything that anybody else touched or not likely to be in contact with anybody except at the store to buy ice cream, you know, <laughs> that, that, there, that I was isolated and I was already in a process of trying to deal with my own grief on a personal level. Uh, mm -hmm. And so these the sort of added rings of, of uh, trouble um, the, the biggest of which, well, I guess global warming is the biggest and then, you know, the COVID as something that comes out of the, the, our degradation of our home. And I mean, so the, these, and then all the way down to my uh, little life, <laughs> I felt, uh, I was saying to Joan before that I felt uh, when I was there as if I was in a moss lined basket 
and I was just curled up inside this basket and I didn't do anything. I, I didn't have to do anything, thankfully. Uh, I could just sit there and, and I didn't write. I didn't listen to music. I don't know what I did for like a couple of months, but I, and I wanted to write it, but it just seemed so inconsequential. It just seemed to, it, it just, it, it, everything I do, I, I, I equate to desire, the desire to write, the desire to create. And it, the desire was just flat in me. It was just, and so I just tried to sit with it, to meditate more, to look around, and uh, to try to keep away from all the politics going on. And yeah, so I, I, I've actually done pretty well. Um, then coming back to Banff and, and then coming here to Regina, it was a nice unfolding. Um, it was not very good <laughs> driving around with Alberta plates for a while there, but, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, I, so on a spiritual level, I feel like I've come out of, I've, I've come out of the, just the shock of it all, as I think so many of us have, what you don't know, and nobody knew how bad it was, or what caused it, or what we we're going to do next, and when would it go away, or, and, and learning, to li learning to live with uncertainty, because we're just not going to know for a mm. long time. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of been my experience with it. What about you, Joan? Well, um, my husband died February 28th, and we were fortunate in that we were able to have a funeral <laughs> that, because it was a sense of um, acknowledging him. It was, it was comforting, actually, to have a funeral. My sister uh, was staying with me a little bit longer, and then all of a sudden she couldn't fly back to Vancouver. So that, I think that was probably good that, you know, I, I've got uh, about six weeks where I'm not sure what happened there, but I think it was probably good that nothing was expected of me because of Kamal's death, but also because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So um, then uh, I decided to come to the Okanagan in May, I came down. And um, that was great too, um, because I went to ground is <laughs> what I call it. Kamal went to ground, I went to ground. And I went to ground in that I stopped um, I listened to the news once a week. I'd, I'd, you know, ask for the CBC news once a week. I listened to it. I didn't, uh, I didn't do too much reaching out. People reached out to me, which, which was great. But I was kind of happy being alone and going out. And I'm in a rural area of the Okanagan, and there was silence, and there were birds and deer and marmots and I would spend the day outside um, gardening I call it gardening because our soil here is basically sand and stone but pe things grow in it it's it's miraculous really and uh, so I worked with native plants and and also putting in introducing other plants that I thought would live here and um, you know the underworld of insects and the birds and the animals and and because of COVID, uh, that was okay. I was, you know, because nothing is, you know, the social self isn't really expected. Mm -hmm. And it was in many ways, COVID has been wonderful. Now, the more I listen to the news, it seems less <laughs> wonderful around the world because, you know, a lot of the, the news is distressing. But um, for me, I think maybe, maybe it, it was a good thing. Yeah, yeah, I hear that. Um, I remember the first couple of weeks of COVID-19 that they uh, that it happened. Um, I was obsessed with the media. I was like on my laptop, on my phone, on the TV, <laughs> everywhere. I was surrounded by the media, surrounded by the 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 news, and it's like hitting me in the face over and over and over. And um, specifically, we went. My husband and I we went down to the supermarket to buy some uh, some food, some meats. And the shelves were completely empty. Like a lot of the supermarket shelves were completely empty, which is a weird thing to see specifically for someone like, I lived through the civil war in Syria. So seeing the shelves empty really triggered that really for me. 
Wow. So I ended up being quite obsessed with the news. And like my 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 husband was like, your shoulders are tight, and your face <laughs> is like tense, and you're reading all the time. So uh, there came a day when he came to me. Is like, no, we're done. We're done with all of this. I'm taking away your laptop. I'm taking away <laughs> your phone. I'm turning yeah. off the TV. You're watching RuPaul's Drag Race. That's what you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> So, so indeed, like that was that was definitely needed. Um, we also had some some major live events. Me and my husband, we we bought a house before we actually before COVID nineteen. But our move in date was April first. So that was uh, that was a lot of stress. And I also was finishing my novel. Like I was I was working on my novel, which is now with my agent. So I'm I'm. St- <laughs> I was working on a novel and moving houses and COVID-19 happened. So my my sense of the world around me felt quite hectic and quite uh, challenging, which reflected itself, to be honest, back in my novel. Like, um, I would say in June, when I went back to the pieces that I wrote in April and May, I was like, this is the worst thing I've ever written. I need to rewrite <laughs> the whole thing. So it really affected me quite quite a lot. But um, I would say that at the moment, as we are creatively trying to come out with new ways to connect, like uh, the three of us would never have connected no. otherwise. You yeah. see what I mean? Like sitting here together and, and talking about our writing and about our, our grief and our lives, I don't think it would ever come together this way without the first circumstance of COVID. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I agree. And there have there have been some wonderful things. I mean, some people have time. You know, yeah. I think one thing that's very difficult is is loss of income for many people. That very frightening. But for those that was it wasn't the case or that could put it aside, a lot of people started doing things they wanted to do but never had time before, mm-hmm. so they could make art and write and do carpentry and gardening and and a lot of people um i've come in contact with have commented on that that there was kind of a gift or people being able to spend time with their kids that wasn't the case for people trying to work at home with kids but <laughs> <laughs> but for those that that weren't going into work they were able to spend time yeah so so there are some things that i and i think environmentally the earth took a little bit of a breather for a while as well oh, wonderful ah oh. and you know those those uh I think of, of writing as, as, well, of creating anything anyway, whether uh, it's a garden or a poem or a story or a piece of music, that the, the, the creative acts are, are hopeful. I mean, it's a, it's a hopeful thing to do, to yeah. pick up a pen or, or, or to go out and plant something in your a little cactus in your sandy garden or, I mean, it, 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 yeah, these are small, important, hopeful acts. Um, that take us or, or, or give us hope in times where you wonder if there is any hope when everything looks so bleak and dark. I completely agree. I completely agree. And now that we uh, took, took an uplifting part of this conversation, <laughs> talking about COVID-19, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to take us back to the work that we had. Just I'll, I'll ask each of you a quick question about your work. And... Um, and then, uh, yeah, let's start with uh, John first. So John, as I said uh, to you before, your poem has cutting words that were used almost, and, and they felt like knives. They felt like knives sliding off the skin. They're integrated, uh, integrated into a taste of, of dark humor. It's so bitter, yet so beautiful. Um, the speaker's trauma, in this case, the speaker's yourself, as you told us, is overwhelming at time, yet intricate in its attention to detail. Um, can you tell me about the process of writing that poem? That poem took two years from the from the dates on it. It took two years of you to write, and I would like to see like how did you do that? From like like was there a specific notebook that you collected all of those um, details in, or is it that just a poem that you kept building upon? 
I basically wrote it as journal entries and at the beginning uh, to kind of keep my sanity, but also to um, have something concrete, mm -hmm. like words on a page seem concrete. It was something that, that I was doing. And as Jill mentioned, you know, the act of creation, all, there all, always is sort of something hopeful in that. Um, but basically, it was all I could write, and I just went to my computer, and sometimes every day. As time went on, it became less often, sometimes just once a month. But I would just kind of spill my guts on the page. And um, little reworking, actually. I have edited it, but not a lot. Mm. And, uh, and for this purpose, I condensed it quite a bit. But uh, yeah, that's kind of what it was and images I noticed. And, you know, certainly there is that, that bitterness I can see in there. And, you know, anger is supposed to be one of the stages of grief. And I didn't feel angry at the time, but I can see now where I was, I was pretty angry. And um, yeah, dark humor is often a way I, I cope with life, <laughs> life's more difficult thing. So definitely that becomes part of it as well. But I wanted it to, I didn't want to edit out the feelings and make them smoother too mm. much. I wanted to, to keep them in. So there hasn't been too much editing. Lovely. Yeah, it feels very raw, to be honest. The poem feels extremely raw. It feels very personal. And and it speaks with, with quite the honesty, to be honest. So I'm I'm, I'm, I'm moved by it every time I read it. Uh, Jill, in, in your novella, um, the, the catalyst in there in the novella is, is the grief for the child that passed away before her time. It's, um, and you just mentioned that you're using the, um, like a family history and navigating this story, this novella. And that's really interesting to me because I would like to know more about how where you stand uh, regarding using personal trauma, big life events as a channel to allow your own writing to evolve. How do you channel such events into your own fiction? Uh, before I begin, I just want to uh, say that I failed to acknowledge our, our position on, on, on uh, unceded territory. Uh, could I just say that of here course, in more than welcome, we're yeah. on Treaty 4 territory, which is the original land of the Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota. And in Banff, where the peace took place, uh, is Treaty 7, uh, where the Blackfoot and Siksika uh, tribes are. So thank you. back to your, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't say that earlier. Um, uh, my writing, like, well, the way I began writing and the way I continue to write is, uh, is out of trying to figure out things. When I first started writing, when I was uh, heavy into the uh, drinking and drugs, when I was eight, 17 and 18 and 20 and early in my 20s, it, it was trying to figure things out that took me to the page and writing things out to try to get perspective and understanding. And it was very much my own intense personal difficulties that were mm -hmm. on the page. And then as I started writing more and more, as I became a writer, uh, and I read people like Margaret Lawrence and, and learned how, how so many people use material from their own life to write fiction or in novels or, or stories. And so that, that, that's where I went. And so, <clears throat> as, as you know, when you start with, uh, with a real event, something, and for me, yes, it was usually something that was terribly wrong or, or, or something that had gone off the rails or some, somebody suffering about something that was what drew me in and made me want to write about it. Um, and then, then, of course, as you write and as you're crafting, the words and sentences and crafting the story, you realize that it doesn't work as nonfiction. In order for it to work as fiction, it has to take off like a plane. It has to cast aside a lot of what really happened and then what the story needs uh, takes is translated into fiction techniques that, that uh, affect the story or the novel as a whole. So working with family history, working with personal experience is, is, uh, is how I write. 
it, it's it's my way of doing it. I'm not a person who uh, creates characters and then puts them in a room and sees what they do. I don't. I don't. I I, I plumb my depths and mine in here and in here and here and and then see what comes from there. Mm, I I I see that. I see that quite a lot. And personally, like I wrote my first novel, The Clothes Aren't Swing. I wrote it. Um, high on drugs all the freaking time mm -hmm. and uh for my next book the, the 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 book that's with my agent at the moment i actually challenged myself to be sober at all times while, while <laughs> so uh -huh. I, and and you can see the differences between the two books because mm -hmm. while i'm navigating traumas in both books um traumas that are quite real for me they might not be personal from a from a narrative perspective, but they are real from the um, the experiences that I had as a as a Syrian man. Um, while I'm navigating those traumas in both books, the first one is uh, quite personal, quite internal. While the next one, the, the one I'm working on right now, is trying to speak um, a more universal language. I would say trying to connect with the word rather than connect with the self. So I I see what you mean from challenging uh, personal events into fiction. I really appreciate that. Um, so before we leave, I would like to ask you both to tell me uh, something. So uh, this is the Saskatoon Public Library's uh, program. I am so proud that I run this, uh, the Writer in Residency program. We came up with some fantastic um, ways to navigate COVID-19, such as this author on author uh, conversation. So for those folks, the creative folks in the Saskatoon, in Saskatoon, hoping to be writers, hoping to, to be word artists and word musicians, um, if you're going to leave them with one message today, what would that be? Do we want to start, John? Okay, one I've always thought of is, uh, one, there was one time when my sister said to me, I always thought I'd be the writer, and I said this to her, and I think it still applies, writers write. <laughs> yes. oh my God. I feel attacked. <laughs> yep. Thank you for that. Uh, Jill, what's your message to the folks? Well, gee, that one I had that lined up right there. <laughs> but I, I would say that even if even if you only have five minutes, even if you you can't say, okay, I'm going to set outside a block of two hours a day and then it doesn't happen. So you go, oh, well, to heck with this, I'm not going to write. No, no, get it where you can. Get to five minutes here, five minutes there. And it, and it adds up. And you get so that it's like going for a run every day. And, and then when you don't go for a run, you go, ah, it doesn't feel right. And that kind of not feeling right helps you get back to the page or back to your running because you're, you've conditioned your mind or your body to do that. And so that gets helpful. So just try to do a bit every day and try not to censor yourself. Just write it out. Nobody's going to read it. Agree. I completely agree. I think that we as authors as well are not kind to ourselves when mm -hmm. we write. A lot of times I think that, yes, do the writing as John's saying and, and uh, force yourself into it the five minutes a day, as Jill is saying, but be kind to what you write. Not every sentence needs to win a freaking Booker Award. <laughs> you can write. That is so write, true. Yeah, yeah, write what you can, and you don't know. Yeah. Maybe, like that would sparkle something, something much more. Yeah. All right. Well, it was a joy to host both of you today. The hour flew by so fast. I'm so thankful that I spent some time with both of you. Uh, much appreciation to uh, to both of you. And thank you for folks who are watching this uh, program. I'll be back next month with two new wonderful authors. And I hope to see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Yeah. Thank you, Jill. <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to see yeah. you.